wouldn't it be fantastic if we could all become smarter, reduce our stress, and express ourselves all while doing something we love? Well, I'm here to tell you that we can achieve all of these things by learning to play a musical instrument. I would like to share with you the positive effects that playing an instrument has on your brain through cognitive development, the added benefits of stress relief through playing an instrument, and finally, the ability to express yourself through your newfound musical outlet. From this, we'll learn the ways that playing an instrument can <clears throat> develop and establish new neural pathways within our brains. It's a positive way to reduce the daily grind that life can force on us, and how to let out certain emotions that we normally cannot express through conversation. There are very few activities that engage all five of the major cortexes in the human brain but music is one of them. Author Noreen Kassim states in the online article, What Parts of the Human Brain Are Stimulated by Music? Livestrong.com, published March 2014, accessed in November 2015, that according to the Alzheimer's Disease Research and, Neurological, and National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the auditory cortex, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the limbic system are all actively engaged while playing musical instrument. All of these fall within the five major cortexes of the human brain. Isn't it wonderful that something as enjoyable as music <coughs> can activate our brain's full potential? The mere fact that we can partake in a form of art and build neural processing skills at the same time is wonderfully astounding. Neuropsychologist Nadine Gabb, the lead researcher of neuropsychology at Boston Children's Hospital, states in the online article written by author George Hicks, How Playing Music Affects the Developing Brain, commonhealth.org, published July 2014, accessed November 2015, that there's a lot of evidence detailing <clears throat> that if you play an instrument or learn to play an instrument, especially starting early in life, that you will develop better reading skills, math skills, etc. Gab and her team determined through a study in both children and adults between playing an instrument and improved executive functioning such as problem solving, switching between tasks, and overall focus. This is great news for parents who want to get their children involved in music early on. Not only will your child be doing something enjoyable and positive, but the activity will also help build a healthy and engaged life in the process. <clears throat> There's also good news for adults pertaining to learning to play an instrument, even if it's later in life. Author Fred Cicchetti states in the online article, is playing music good for your health? LifeScience.com, published October 2013, access November 2015, that in a study published by the American Psychological Association, conducted at the University of Kansas Medical Center, a group of adults were given several cognitive-based tests. The groups were divided into people who could play a musical instrument and into people who couldn't. The study showed that the people who could play scored better on every single test, as opposed to the people who could not play. <clears throat> the research team stated that since studying an instrument requires years of learning and practice, that it could create alternate connections in our brains that could <clears throat> fill the gaps and compensate for the cognitive declines as we grow older. So even as we lose certain aspects of our cognitive development as we grow older, playing an instrument can fill the gap to come with aging. Next, I would like to talk about stress and how playing an instrument can help reduce it. According to author Susan Kuchinskis in her online article, How Making Music Reduces Stress, reviewed by Patricia A. Farrell, PhD, on WebMD.com, published October 2010, accessed November 2015, that the American Psychological Association found that playing an instrument can short circuit our body's stress response and even help it from becoming chronic. Playing an instrument sets off an opposite response in our bodies and our brains, stabilizing our heart rate and lowering our blood pressure. Studies have also shown that 
Playing an instrument can lessen anxiety and depression. Being a musician, I can attest that nothing will calm me down quicker than picking up my guitar and simply playing a few chords. Everything from feeling my fingers glide across the strings to hearing what I'm actually playing <clears throat> can act at times as a proverbial masseuse. As my mind submerges into sonic bliss, I can literally feel my heart rate slow down. It is in a way a form of stress reducing therapy and a beautiful one at that. Finally, I would like to talk about music as a form of expression. Being able to convey thought and emotion through songwriting has greatly benefited me throughout my life. Again, it's always been very therapeutic to have an alternative outlet to conversation so I could express myself. Some emotions require words and some don't. The beauty of playing an instrument to create art is that you have a secondary voice to rely on when words fail to describe what needs to be said. Author Courtney S. Warren, PhD, states in the online article, Music is what feelings sound like, psychologytoday.com, published October 2013, access November 2015, that music is an incredible vehicle for expressing emotion and capturing our internal experience in life. I agree with her assessment. From experiencing death to the joyful highs of extreme success, every emotion fits into music in some form or some way. Some of the greatest music has been created from the ashes of depression, from the rage of anger, or from the joys of happiness. So no matter what is inside you that needs to come out, music is the conduit that you need, and your instrument is the tool for the job. In closing, there are many benefits to playing a musical instrument. It is a means in both children and adults to help create a blueprint for a life of healthy cognitive development. Playing can also reduce the stress in our daily lives, making us healthier. And lastly, it's a positive outlet to, create, to express ourselves creatively. As I've discussed learning to play an instrument with you here today, I hope I've influenced you to pick one out and give it a try. Personally, I can tell you that there's nothing quite like uh, creating something that not only is beneficial to your health, but can also put a smile on another person's face. Music is commonly known as a universal <coughs> language. So just imagine being able to speak that language with an instrument of your choice. Thank you for your time. Imagine, if you will, you're sitting by a nice, warm campfire. Your friends are nestled safely in their sleeping bags and the tents all around you. But you hear a noise. The crack of branches, the rustling of leaves, they alert you to someone approaching your camp. Suddenly, a man steps into the light. Before you can introduce yourself, before you can even say a word, he draws a knife on you. What do you do? That is a typical scene from a tabletop role-playing game. Today, I'm going to tell you about role-playing games and how they benefit everyone and why you should play them. I will tell you how they benefit you socially. I will explain how they help to foster creativity and why that is a benefit. And I will discuss how they teach you to creative thinking or thinking critically. Hopefully, once you know the benefits of role-playing games, you'll find a group to play with and delve into this wonderful pastime for yourself. First, I will talk to you about how benefits you show socially. Before we can see the social benefits, we must know how role-playing games work. Basically, you have one person who is called a dungeon master, game master, storyteller, depending on the game you're looking at, who creates the plot and drives the story, while every other player creates a persona to exist inside this world, often called a player character. By its very nature, role-playing games are social functions. Humans are social creatures. We require social interaction and a source of belonging. RPGs can provide that and are often means of forging lifelong friendships. Let me tell you about a personal story. The summer after I was in fifth grade, my father lost his job and we had to move to another city so that he could find work. This was the days before social media, so when you had to move, it meant leaving your friends behind and creating an entire new group of friends. For me, role-playing games helped me do that. I was carrying one of my books around, as I often do, when a kid at school noticed and said, well, how long have you been playing? We struck up a conversation about the role-playing games, which led to me being invited to their group and I made my group of friends instantly. I started playing with them weekly. As a matter of fact, it was through that group of friends that I met my wife. 
we met at a friend of mine's house. We got together and we're still happily married today. To go further, the very kid that first noticed my book was the best man at our wedding. I'm not the only person who has benefited socially from role playing games, however. Authors John Michaud wrote an article titled, Dungeons and Dragons Saved My Life for the New Yorker Periodical. It was published July 16, 2014. I accessed it electronically in November of 2015. In his article, he discusses how his daily routine consisted mostly of watching TV. His grades were mediocre at best, he didn't have many friends, and he'd lost his passion for gaming because he had a very competitive father who didn't believe on taking it easy on kids. And as we all know, always losing is not fun. Then something amazing happened to him. He was introduced to Dungeons and Dragons, the most popular role-playing game, by a group of neighborhood boys. Playing the game improved his grades, but also taught him the skills to be successful journalist. Playing as part of a group taught him how to collaborate and use teamworking skills, which directly translated to him working with other authors as he grew older. His friend Paul Taylor, from the same group, went on to start two successful technology companies. Paul attributed his success to learning skills around the gaming table about how to deal with unpredictable people and how to deal with diverse situations as people made different choices. Now, I would like to talk to you about how RPGs help to build creativity and why that is a benefit to you. On the website of the New York Times, in an article titled, A Game is Literary Tutorial by Ethan Gilsdorf, which I accessed November of 2015, he talks about how role-playing games has influenced an entire generation of artists and authors. Some of the names off of his extensive list that you may be familiar with are George R. R. Martin, the author behind the uh, popular series Game of Thrones, which is currently on HBO. Also, comedian Stephen Colbert, Robin Williams, and Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, all got inspiration from playing role-playing games when they were younger. A name that wasn't on the list, but you may be even more familiar with, is action star Vin Diesel. He's very open about his role-playing hobby, and as a matter of fact, his upcoming movie, The Last Witch Hunter, is based off of a character he created and played in his high school role-playing group. The benefits of creativity are not just limited to the entertainment industry, though. Another article from the New York Times titled, Your Brain on Fiction by Annie Murphy Paul, which was printed on March 17th of 2012, but which I accessed in November of 2015, refers to multiple scientific studies on the effects of storytelling on our brain. An RPG is storytelling. That's what the entire purpose of the game is. In the study, they hooked pay, er, subjects to machines, and they found that when they're presented information to different sources, their brain reacted differently. If they were given a fact sheet or watched a slideshow, only the parts of their brain necessary to process information would become active. However, when that same information was presented to them by another human in the form of a story, something wonderful happened. When they were told a story about delicious foods, the parts of their brain that determine taste would become active. If they were told a story about something activity, the part of their brain that, that uh, governs motor skills would light up. Even better, they found that this reaction was even stronger in the person telling the story. Which brings me, your brain is a muscle and it needs exercise like every other muscle. These studies prove that through the use of storytelling and role playing games, you learn how to use parts of your brain that you don't normally use in your daily actions. You also learn to use your brain in new ways for creative problem solving, which brings me to my final point. Role playing games helps us to develop critical thinking skills. This occurs even from a young age and is integral to our development. How many kids grew up playing cops and robbers? This is just a simple form of a role playing game. These kids would take on the persona of one side or the other, either the cop or the robber. If you were a cop, you had to figure out how to catch those pesky robbers. If you were a robber, you had to find out how to elude those troublesome cops so that you could get away with your dastardly plans. These children were developing critical thinking skills without even knowing it. By taking on roles outside our own experience, we also take on the problems of those roles. We have to find ways to creatively solve those problems. The best part is you can do it risk-free by role playing. If you come up with a solution and it doesn't work, you're free to rethink your idea and attempt something different the next time. RPGs afford the same opportunity to the people who play them. Dr. Rachel E. White discusses the importance of this type of role playing in The Power of Play, a research summary on play and learning which she published for the Minnesota Children's <coughs> Museum, which I accessed in November of 2015 via their website, mcm.org. In her research, she states that pretend play, which includes RPGs, 
correlate to benefits in cognitive development in areas such as executive function, which is our critical thinking and decision-making process. To demonstrate this, think back to my introduction. You have been presented a potentially dangerous situation. Someone has come into your camp, they've drawn a weapon. You're asked to make a decision. You could draw your own weapon and attack the man. You could try diplomacy and try to talk the man down. You could shout a warning and try to wake up your friends, or you can turn tail and run away and leave them to fend for themselves. <laughs> the point is that no matter what your decision was, it will lead to new problems and new situations, and you will continually have to make new decisions and adapt on the fly. Also take into account that every character has their own strengths and weaknesses. When making your decision, not only do you have to consider your own strengths and weaknesses, you have to consider the strengths and weaknesses of your friends and the other group mates, because everybody working together is how you solve these problems. You can do this completely risk-free with no real-life consequences. That is, unless you decided to turn tail and run and you got all of your friends killed. That is a good way to lose pizza privileges. I know, I've done it. A lot. <laughs> Hopefully, when you look at role-playing games, you will now see the benefit they provide. They provide social benefits and are a great tool for making friends. They foster creativity and build storytelling skills, which benefit your brain function, and they help to develop critical thinking skills that will help you to adapt to diverse situations in real life. I will leave you with this. If you aren't a role-player, you should be. And as a side note, I have extra dice, and there's always space at my table. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I want to talk to you about, all right, just hang on a second. My phone's going off. Sorry. Speech class right now. Seems kind of important. TTYL. Okay, yeah, all right, all right, single. But I might as well prove that I'm in speech class, right? So uh, let's go ahead and just, uh, we'll get a selfie. Make sure they, no, we're in speech class. Everybody smile. You Mr. Lawson back there, give us a smile. Ready? One, two, three, cheese. Good. All right, awesome. Okay. Yeah. And what was I saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Today, I'm here to tell you about how social media and text messaging can have negative effects on your life. Today, I'm going to tell you about how people are addicted to it. I'll tell you how people lack social interaction skills because of it. And lastly, how social networking can hinder you when getting hired for jobs. Now, by presenting you with this information, hopefully you have a better understanding on how social media and text messaging can affect your life. Now, by a show of hands, how many in here own a cell phone? Mm, yeah. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you check your Facebook or text messages daily? Mm, just about everybody, okay. Now, the hardest question. By a show of hands, how many of you all use your cell phone when you're on the potty? Those of you that aren't hanging, holding up your hands are just ashamed to admit it. <laughs> now, an article written on student.societyofscience.org by Kathy Ann Kalowski on September 2014, and I accessed on November 2015, says that college students spend on an average nine hours a day on their cell phones. That's nine hours a day. That's more time than what you all usually spend sleeping in the night. On that same survey, it says, Back, going back to my potty question, 40% of those students admit to using their cell phones while on the potty. Now, it's common knowledge that most people know that you can be addicted to things such as alcohol, drugs, or cigarettes, but what most people don't know is that you can be addicted to behaviors as well. Now, several studies research that the same conclusion that our brain is wired to seek validation. We want that instant gratification. We want those social interactions online like Facebook likes and retweets because it gives our brain that hit of dopamine and that dopamine causes that addictive behavior because we want that instant gratification. Those virtual interactions such as texting, emailing, and tweeting and Snapchat, according to PewResearch.org, written by Monica Anderson on 2015 in April and I accessed on November 2015, says that today two-thirds that's about 64% of people in America own cell phones. 46% of them also say that they couldn't live without their cell phone. Now, no one wants to admit that they're addicted to their cell phones. But I ask you, can you go all day without your cell phone? Yeah. Hashtag challenge accepted. <laughs> now, this brings me to my next point. Lacking social interaction skills. We would much rather be on Facebook and messaging somebody about how nice they look rather than talk to them face to face. 
Now we like that social interaction. And it might be nice to send them a message, but me, I would say, Caitlin, I really love yellow on you. You look beautiful in it. You do. Martha, I love that you had your hair fixed. I noticed you had a perm put in. Now see, it's much better to have that face-to-face -face interaction because they can see if you're being genuine or not. And people lose the ability to read body language and if you're being sincere. You can't get that from receiving a text message. On CNN.com, Jeffrey Kluger wrote on August 2012, and I accessed on November 2015, that Americans aged 18 to 29 on average received 88 texts per day. Now this was written in 2012. Those numbers have grown exponentially over the years. People are becoming more conversationally avoidant. Now, going to conversationally avoidant, I'm going to use Miss Martha and Kelly as an example. Martha may want me to do some ornaments for her, and Kelly is waiting for her ornament order. But I see her coming at me in the hallway, so what am I going to do? Reach for my cell phone. Oh, oh, hey, Josh. Um, uh, do you have uh, some food and stuff ready for me and the kids? Because uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that tonight. Okay, yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later. Now that they've passed me by, I don't have to worry about talking to them because I'm using my phone to be socially avoidant with them. Now, I'll also take into account Thanksgiving. We just celebrated that last week. Thanksgiving to me is you celebrating with your family. You're sitting around the table, you're talking with family and friends, and you're having a good time and enjoying that meal. But no, I'd say over half of you had this little thing in your hands sitting there going, Wow, this is an awesome Thanksgiving. The food tastes great. I'm going to take a picture of this turkey and put it on Instagram. Yeah. Hashtag turkey. Hashtag Thanksgiving. Hashtag food porn. Hashtag blessed. And yes, I've seen those last two side by side on Instagram. <laughs> so, <laughs> nobody's engaging in conversation. And this little device keeps us from making genuine memories with our family and our friends. Lastly, I want to talk to you about what you post on social media and how it can hinder you in getting a job. Now, you remember those cool pictures that you took not too long ago going to a party and you have a beer in your hand? Or you might have something in between your fingers you might not want everybody to see? Or let's talk about those little unmentionable photos that you're sharing between people that you think that nobody else is going to get a hold of. Well, guess what? When that's on the internet, it's on there forever. And it says that on an article on CNN.com written by Laura Vanderkam on October 2012, and I accessed on November 2015, that a, a survey confirmed 70% of U.S. managers will not hire you because they will Google you online. They'll see that you're used to poor grammar, your discriminatory marks against race, gender, politics, religion, and those photos that you post and heck, even your screen name if they deem it unprofessional. So it's crucial to keep your virtual self, well, virtuous. <laughs> now, now that I've presented you with all this glorious information about how social media and text messaging can have a negative effect on your life, I want you to remember that addiction is more than just a drug. It comes in the form of behaviors. And also, the same little screen can prevent you from having social interaction. And lastly, what you post online can help or hurt you. After all, we want everybody to like us, right? <laughs> Thank you.